okay. Hug it tight. Hug it tight. Finish, finish, finish. I uh, met Carl when he was in the sixth grade. He went to school with my son at Glencrest in Fort Worth. Um, and him and my son used to hang out. He would always come over to my house. My house was always kind of the hangout spot for, for my son and his friends. Carl had a rough background. His biological father, to my knowledge, hasn't been in his life since he was a kid. Carl moved in my house when he was in eighth grade. That's when I took um, temporary guardianship over him. It was an easy decision taking in another responsibility because I was a single mother. Um, but I decided to go ahead and let him move in and try to get him, stir him back on the right path. At Forest Oak, you know, he was one of the captains, running back, fullback, and middle linebacker. And it was, that was his life. <laughs> That's all he talked about, going to college and playing football. Well, the first time I ever met him, uh, it was him and Miss Lisa. They were uh, outside meeting Coach Wager standing outside his office, and I was just thinking like, dang, who is this big grown man coming up to our school? Everybody was like, he played quarterback, running back, wide receiver, defense. I'm like, man, this dude was probably cold. He just turned into a force on the football field. Fast, tough, physical, strong, and relentless. It wasn't long uh, before I realized that he had a lot on his plate. Obviously, trying to get caught up academically, um, you know, just some of the instability that he'd experienced throughout his first 15 or 16 years that he was trying to desperately get into order and most of which because he didn't want to let the team down. Soon after that I learned that that he had a son and, and then I realized that he was probably dealing with more challenges at the age of 16 than I was at the age of 42. When King was first born he was born micropreme and I remember getting a phone call and rushing to the hospital and just looking at Carl in the hallway and you could tell he'd been, he'd been crying, he was scared. Doctors didn't um, really think that the baby was going to make it. When his baby was in the hospital, he was going back and forth to Dallas. Um, he would go to football practice in the afternoon. He would drive over to Dallas where his um, baby was in the hospital. And he would spend the night there and he would do his homework. And often when he would come back to school, if he was late, I would have notes from the staff there at the hospital, you know, confirming that he had been there. It was just amazing that he was able to keep up with that, keep up with his work, pass his classes, and still take that responsibility of being at that hospital all night with that baby every night. The very first time that I met with him, right away I sensed a sense of calmness about him. One of the things that really struck me from the very beginning was he was living independently, he was taking care of his child, he was working, and he was coming to school, and he was playing football. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I asked him, you know, how do you do this? How, you know, how are you ma managing to, to do all this? And, and he told me that from the very beginning, that he wanted to be a good father, he wanted to have a strong presence in his child's life, and, um, and that he loved to play football and that he wanted to have a football scholarship. And so I just knew that this was a very special young man. King, come here. Come here. The first time I met Carl Jr. was was post scrimmage at the first scrimmage of Carl's junior year. And it was very, very evident the love that he had for him. He was so proud to introduce his son to us and, and we were so proud to meet him and that very quickly turned into okay this is Carl's son 
now this becomes an additional member of our family and our team. From football practice, we go straight out forward Fort Worth, Hill to go get his son. That's all we did. We just hung with his son all the time, and that was his life. That was the only thing he cared about. He always told me if something was to ever happen to him or if anything was to ever go wrong, just to make sure that, you know, King would be all right. Then we started to have some of those deep conversations, meaningful conversations about, okay, where do I want to go in my life and why do I want to go there? And Carl never wavered from the fact that he wanted to use football as a vehicle to continue his education, to enable his son to have a better life than he had. And where he really learned to shine was, was on special teams. He was a great kickoff cover man because he was absolutely fearless, yet he possessed the athleticism to be able to get down the field. He was terrific on punt block. He blocked a number of kicks over the course of his career. Uh, really any phase of special teams that you put him in, he was gonna thrive because he only had one speed. And that speed was wide open all the time. Practice, games, weight room, you name it. When Carl Wilson walked through that locker room door, he was full tilt from start to finish. At the end of the football season, we immediately went into working on recruiting. And so we went on tryouts. We went to Kilgore that Saturday. Um, we went out there and spent the day out there and he tried out. He did all different kind of football drills and things like that. He felt like he did really, really well. Um, he did really well in a lot of the drills. He was really excited about going to college once that process started. Carl called me a little after one. He was pretty upset. He said those guys were messing with him again. I actually was uh, on the phone with him basically the whole day, like from lunch when it all started. And I was just talking to him like, you know, everything good. He was like, yeah, bro, you know, I'm about to go home. I ain't got no period. I'm finna go home, go to sleep. And I was just about to go pick him up. The crazy thing is, Miss Lisa had just left. Like, she just left his house, and I had just got off the phone with her when I was leaving the school. I said, I'm finna go get Carl in a minute. She was like, okay. That was the end of that conversation. And I went to his apartment, and I went in, and he was laying across the bed asleep. I don't even remember seeing his face. He just kind of turned over, reached in his pocket, and he kind of tossed the keys at me. And I said, okay, don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. And I left, and um, uh, I went to go get my son, and I pulled up to the school, and I remember looking at my phone to see what time it was, and right when I looked at my phone, it was 3.56, and then this number called me, and this girl was yelling and saying that, um, that Carl was shot and he wasn't moving. And um, I was like, I just started screaming. I said, what do you mean he was at home sleep? You know, <laughs> what do you mean he's not moving? Where are y'all? Have you called the police? I was just yelling. And she was like, no, I haven't called the police yet. And I hung up on her and I, I just, I made a U-turn. I didn't even get my son. I made a U-turn and raced back over there. I knew what happened because I seen it like, Perfectly, I seen everything. It just the only thing was just too far to see faces. Everybody in the car froze up. I was just the only one in the car that was like, you know, go, go, go. We need to get to him. It wasn't my first time, you know, ever seeing that, but it was my first time seeing that happen to somebody that was just so close to me. I was at the American Football Coaches Association National Convention. I was actually standing outside the ballroom where the event was being held. And normally, at this type of environment, you wouldn't answer your phone. You know, you just go ahead and, and let it buzz. And, and we were standing outside waiting to get in. And, and I just briefly looked down and 
it was the dad of, of one of our other players, and he said, Coach, you got to get down here. Um, Carl Wilson's laying in the middle of the street, and there's thousands of coaches around, and I thought, surely I, I can't be hearing this clearly. And I walked um, over to the side, uh, a quieter portion of the hotel, and I said, can you please repeat that? And he said, Coach, there's police cars everywhere, and Carl Wilson, number 28, is lying in the middle of the road. He's been shot and killed. And I just went, no. I couldn't see his face. They had the hoodie covering his head. And I just remember looking at his hands, this, looking at his hands, just waiting for it to move. And it never moved. Very rarely did I see him tardy in the morning, but that particular morning he was tardy. And he and I um, had a conversation, you know, how's life going, everything's going great, you know, we were just chit-chatting there and, you know, he had had a rough morning. As we talked, you know, he um, was going to go on to class and he just looked at me and he said, you know what, Ms. Jates, though, this, though it didn't go great this morning, this, I'm going to make this a good day. And I said, you make this a good day, Carl. You make this the best day ever. And he left and I didn't see him the rest of the day until I received the news of what had happened. And I've shared that with many people. I think it signifies who he was as a student, as a father. How do you tell them that it's going to be okay? Because it's not okay. People were scared, they were broken, they were uh, in disbelief, I mean, every emotion that you could possibly tag onto, we were all experiencing it. He motivates me. He's always motivated me. Even when he was here, he used to, you know, I can be standing on the sideline, he'll walk up to me and slap the mess out of my helmet. He'd be like, let's go. When you get out there, I need a touchdown. That's what he'll tell me. Like, when you get out there, I need you to touch the ball, I need you to score. And when I hear that now, I hear that every time. I touched the ball, I'm like, I need to score. That's all he told me. He said, work hard, you're going to get what you want. Keep moving forward. Never look back at the past. Never look at the bad things. Always look at the good stuff. One thing about Carl is, if he trusted you, then he was your family. It didn't matter if he didn't have it, he would try to get it for you if you needed it. It don't matter what it was, no matter what the situation was. Uh, I remember a day I was at the school and didn't have a ride home. I called Carl, he said he was getting his hair cut. And I said, oh, all right, I'm gonna I'm I'm just walk then. So while I'm walking down the street, here come Carl pulling up in the Cadillac. <laughs> Going about 10 miles per hour because his transmission was about to go out. <laughs> when he pulled up on the side of me and I opened the door, he still had the thing on from the barber shop. <laughs> Carl was well known because of his prowess on the football field, but he was also very well known because this great, big, strong, good-looking linebacker was friends with everybody. He just was welcoming and embraced and loved everybody and never judged anyone. And, and I think that, in great part, is why it rocked this community as much as it did. Carl and I were close. We were really, really close. And I was torn between the formality of the event and I didn't want to take anything away from all of the other graduates. And the response that I got back from those kids was completely unselfish and said, Coach, we, we would love for you 
uh, to honor him in that way. We want him to be a part of this day. As I stood there on the stage and worked my way up the stairs, I had a sport coat on over the top. Um, you know, I graduated a long time ago, but I was nervous. Obviously, I was full of emotion, and I was hoping that I didn't break down before I got to that point. And uh, as I waited my turn and, and allowed the, the other graduates to clear the stage, when they finally called Carl's name, and, and I walked across the stage and took off that jacket and, and showed that number 28 football jersey, the entire arena just erupted and the tears started flowing down my face, down everybody else's face. Coach Robert Wager will be accepting a diploma on behalf of the family of Carl Darwin Wilson. I think it was a great moment for peace for his classmates, peace for those that were in that arena, um, and a huge moment for, for Carl's family as well. After wandering around at the convention the night that Carl was killed and sitting in the hotel room with a number of our coaching staff members, uh, mostly just staring at the wall and, and keeping our thoughts inside, I'll, I'll never forget Carl's position coach saying to me, Coach Shrags, I can't wait to tell Carl Jr what a great man his father was. And what we would tell you, Carl Jr., is that your father was a fierce competitor. He had a phenomenal work ethic. He was a joy to be around and a joy to coach every single day. He competed in the classroom the same way that he did on the field. And Carl was a man that when he said you could count on him, you really could. And he was a great teammate, a great friend, uh, and above all else, the number one love that he had in his life was the love for you. King, I think the most important thing that your dad would want you to know is how much he loved you, how much you meant to him, you were his world. He changed his entire life for you. He would do anything for you. And he just wanted the best for you. He wanted the best for you. He would do anything to provide that to you. And he loved you so much. And I just never want you to forget that. <laughs>